The history of the short story is the history of losers. Yes, you heard me right. That's losers with a capital L. Now, many of us don't want to read about losers, <laughs> mainly because we don't want to be identified with losers, and certainly not as losers, and because most of us live in the U.S. where winning is everything, the idea that losers is a proper subject for fiction might seem unpatriotic, even un-American. But for those of you who have your doubts, I'd like to argue that we're all losers, and that that's not a bad thing necessarily. We all lose, all the time. We lose our socks and our cell phones and our watches. We lose our ways. We lose our jobs. We lose our houses to foreclosure. We lose girlfriends and boyfriends, husbands and wives, sisters and brothers, mothers and fathers. Eventually, we lose everything, as Ivan Ilyich does when he dies a particularly terrible death in Tolstoy's famous short story. This isn't a cheerful prospect, but it's the truth. So, it's all right to be a loser, and certainly all right to write about losers. In fact, one can't really begin writing powerful short stories until one comes to accept one's losses. More important, some of the greatest short stories ever written are about losers, people who lose big time. There's no bi bigger loser, for example, than Franz Kafka's Gregor Zamza, yet the story of a man who wakes up as a giant dung beetle is a masterpiece that will outlive us all. Frank O'Connor, author of The Lonely Voice, a study of the short story, now back in print, puts it a little bit more politely. The short story he writes in the short introduction I've asked you to read for this class is the province of those lonely voices sometimes barely surviving on the periphery of society. If, as the saying goes, only the winners end up writing history, then the short story is a kind of corrective. The losers get to speak or get their stories told. Seems fair enough. The modern and contemporary short story, then, is a celebration of those who lose. And as we move from the early precursors of the short story to the modern contemporary and postmodern story, you'll find that most of the stories we read share this one thing in common. The first appearance of what O'Connor calls the little man may be Akaki Akakievich in Nikolai Gogol's The Overcoat. In this story, we see for perhaps the first time in the short story form a shift in attention away from the so-called heroic characters that served as the appropriate subjects for literature to anti-heroic characters, characters who lose rather than win. These characters, O'Connor writes, are tramps, spoiled priests, wild boys or girls, dreamers, misunderstood and lonely idealists, and of course artists. And the shift to voices previously unheard or heard only as echoes from the distance in literature has deeply enriched literature itself, especially the modern short story form. One could even say that the short story has democratized literature, made it far more diverse and inclusive, giving voice to historically silenced minorities. In a very real sense, as the short story has evolved and grown from the modern to the contemporary and postmodern eras, the gallery of new faces and voices it represents has grown almost exponentially, from its earliest precursors and the most well-known practitioners of the form, to those voices who historically might have been ignored or even silenced, enriching the form, yet still in many ways paying homage to characters who might remain on the fringes of society. Anton Chekhov and Leo Tolstoy's serfs and peasants have much in common with Raymond Carver's blue-collar workers and John Cheever's suburbanites, Sherman Alexie and Louise Erdrich's reservation bluesmen and women, Juno Diaz's Dominicanos and Sandra Cisneros' Chicanos and Chicanas, as well as the hyphenated American characters, Indian American, African American, Gay American, and so on, of such short story writers as Jhumpa Lahiri, John Edgar Wideman, and David Levitt. And the form itself has evolved from traditional linear structures to nonlinear structures in the stories of such writers as John Barth, Donald Barthelme, Margaret Atwood, and David Foster Wallace. The evolution of the short story, though shorter than that of the novel, shares many of the same characteristics, but as Frank O'Connor writes in his introduction to The Lonely Voice, 
One could not make a novel out of a copying clerk with a name like Akaki Akakievich who merely needed a new overcoat than one could make one out of a child called Tommy Tompkins whose penny had gone down the drain. No, a short story is a different animal altogether than a novel, and unlike the novel, it shares with lyric poetry many of the same essential characteristics. The nearest thing to lyric poetry is the short story O'Connor told the Paris Review in an interview before his death. A novel actually requires far more logic and far more knowledge of circumstances, whereas the short story can have the sort of detachment from circumstances that lyric poetry has. Unlike the novel, O'Connor suggests the short story is a closer cousin to poetry than to the novel. One of these characteristics is extreme compression, focusing on one event or a few events which come to represent an entire life. And with its focus on representative details that carry the emotion and meaning of the story, O'Connor argues that the short story is a more difficult form to write than the novel. Since a whole lifetime must be crowded into a few minutes, O'Connor writes, those minutes must be carefully chosen and lit by an unearthly glow that enables us to distinguish present, past, and future as though they were all contemporaneous. The short story, he continues, is an organic form that springs from a single detail and embraces past, present, and future. And the storyteller differs from the novelist in this. He must be more of a writer, more of an artist, more of a dramatist. Another characteristic of the modern short story is that it usually ends with a complete reversal in character, usually accompanied by or triggered by a powerful recognition. In some dramatic forms like the stage play, the term recognition means exactly that, an actual recognition. Someone who has been deceiving us suddenly takes off a mask and we realize who, who he or she really is. James Joyce had another term for it that's become a part of everyday language, the epiphany. The term, based upon the Catholic feast of the Epiphany in which Christ manifested himself to the Magi and all Gentiles, means a sudden moment of revelation or insight, or, as Joyce put it, a sudden spiritual manifestation, which a writer must record with extreme care, seeing that they themselves are the most delicate and evanescent of moments. In a sense, characters are unmasked but in different ways. What they thought was true about themselves or others turns out to be something altogether different than they, and we expected. One such moment occurs in Joyce's Araby, when the narrator who has deceived himself into believing the romantic notion that his friend Mangan's sister might care about him says, Gazing up into the darkness I saw myself as a creature driven and derided by vanity, and my eyes burn with anguish and anger. Another example occurs in perhaps the most beautiful ending ever written and James Joyce's The Dead. In a sense, in all these epiphanies, we must confront change, as in the moment when a peripheral character in Gogol's The Overcoat thinks, and from that day forth, everything was, as it were, changed and appeared in a different light to him. This statement could easily be the template from which the recognition scene or epiphany in the modern short story is grown. And in such moments, Gogol's narrator continues, one realizes how much inhumanity there is in man, how much savage brutality lies hidden under refined, cultured politeness. The beautifully lyrical ending of O'Connor's powerful story, Guest of a Nation, like the ending of many stories we'll read this semester, Joyce's The Dead, John Cheever's The Swimmer, and many others, share with it this sense of intense human loneliness, of such historically silenced voices O'Connor writes about. I was somehow very small and very lost and lonely like a child astray in the snow, and anything that happened to me afterwards I never felt the same about again.